What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about ventricular tachycardia. We're going to go over the definition, how to identify this rhythm on the EKG, the etology, patient presentation, and how do we treat these patients. Ventricular tachycardia can be broken down into many different types, such as non-sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. First, let's talk about how to define non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, and keep in mind there are varying opinions on the best definition, but we will go over the most commonly used definition today. In non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, you will have three or more consecutive premature ventricular contractions, a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute, and a duration lasting less than 30 seconds. So here you can see a five beat run of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia with a heart rate of about 165 beats per minute and lasting less than 30 seconds. Sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia can be defined by the following characteristics. A regular wide QRS complex greater than 120 milliseconds with a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. The arrhythmia will last greater than 30 seconds or cause hemodynamic collapse in less than 30 seconds. It will also have consecutive ventricular beats that have a uniform and stable QRS morphology. So here you can see a regular wide QRS complex at around 160 milliseconds with a heart rate of about 300 beats per minute, and this would have to last longer than 30 seconds or cause hemodynamic collapse in less than 30 seconds. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia can be defined as a ventricular rhythm with a rate greater than 100 beats per minute with continuously varying QRS complex morphology and any EKG lead. For example, here's a continuous rhythm strip showing multiple episodes of non-sustained polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Both the QRS complexes and the R to R intervals have variable morphology and the QT interval is normal. Now let's talk briefly about another type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, also known as torsades de pointis. Torsades de pointis is a form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It occurs in the setting of acquired or congenital QT interval prolongation and will have a ventricular rhythm greater than 100 beats per minute with frequent variations seen in QRS axis, morphology, or both. The QRS complex will look like they're twisting around the isoelectric line, and that's why it's called torsades de pointis, or twisting of the points. A corrected QT interval greater than 0.45 seconds is considered prolonged in men, and greater than 0.45 to 0.47 is prolonged in women. These long QT intervals predispose the patient to what we like to call the R on T phenomenon. This is when a premature ventricular contraction occurs during the preceding T wave. Here's an EKG tracing of the R on T phenomenon. And here's another, this time caused from a premature atrial contraction in a patient with severe hypokalemia, as can be inferred from the inverted T waves and prominent U waves. So now we know how to identify the different types of ventricular tachycardias on the EKG, but now, what are the mechanisms behind this deadly arrhythmia? Well, there are basically two ways in which this electrical conduction can start in the ventricle. Either the impulse arises from a focal area in the ventricles or a reentrant circuit. So the first mechanism, let's say an area in the right ventricle becomes stressed or irritable secondary to ischemia, electrolyte abnormalities, methamphetamines, to name a few causes, and starts conducting PVCs. Well, if this area keeps conducting impulses quicker than the SA node, it will take over, causing the heart to beat at a ridiculously fast rate. However, reentrant circuits much more commonly cause ventricular tachycardia. They are most commonly caused secondary to myocardial infarctions. For example, let's say we have a patient who just had a recent STEMI and portions of his heart wall have died with scar tissue formation. Well, in areas with overlapping blood supply, it is possible for some cardiac myocytes to survive and create a split pathway because they have to go around dead tissue in the center. So if you take a look at this picture, the black area represents dead myocardial tissue, and the pink tissue within the black necrotic zone, while it has survived, it is still damaged compared to the healthy adjacent pink tissue. Now, although this tissue has survived, depolarization and repolarization properties can be significantly altered compared to the adjacent healthy tissue outside the black region seen in pink. So let's say an impulse comes and starts to depolarize both the healthy and the damaged tissue. In this example, we are looking at the top blue arrow right now, and the healthy tissue is on the right, and the damaged tissue is on the left, where the arrow is pointing to. Well, the healthy tissue on the right 
is going to depolarize faster than that damaged tissue and then start to travel back up the damaged tissue until it meets the depolarization impulse of the damaged tissue causing a unidirectional block. Then let's say the healthy tissue has a longer refractory period. And remember, during the refractory period, an impulse cannot be conducted down this healthy tissue. So let's say the next impulse comes and only the damaged tissue is out of its refractory period. The impulse will then travel down the damaged side and by the time it gets to the healthy side, the healthy side will be out of its refractory period and the impulse can travel back up the healthy side and then down the unhealthy side over and over and over again, causing a reentry circuit, thus creating ventricular tachycardia. So now we know how to identify these rhythms on the EKG and what causes them. Briefly, let's talk about how these patients will present and how to treat them. Patients might present with palpitations, chest pains, shortness of breath, syncope or presyncope, sudden cardiac arrest, or general malaise. In addition, most of your patients who develop this rhythm will have an underlying structural heart disease, such as coronary heart disease with a recent myocardial infarction, heart failure, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and many others. So how do we treat these patients? Initial management for all patients with suspected ventricular tachycardia should be done as follows. Briefly assess the patient to determine if they are stable or unstable. An unstable patient will have evidence of hemodynamic compromise such as hypotension, altered mental status, chest pain, or heart failure. But they generally will remain awake with a palpable pulse, whereas stable patients will show no evidence of hemodynamic compromise despite a rapid heart rate. However, these stable patients can rapidly become unstable, so do not think that they are any less risk of sudden cardiac death because they can turn on you quickly. So in your unstable patient, while you're having one of your nurses get the crash cart, quickly establish IV access, obtain a 12-lead EKG, administer supplemental oxygen, and send blood to the lab. You will want to order a CBC, CMP, PT, PTT, INR, magnesium, troponin, digoxin, procainamine, and quinidine levels if they are taking these medications to rule out toxicities. Now, let's go over how to treat the unstable patient without a pulse. In the unstable patient who is hypotensive, pulseless, and has become unconscious, you're going to want to treat them by the ACLS resuscitation guidelines. Start CPR immediately and provide adequate oxygenation with the bag valve mask. Continue CPR while attaching the defibrillation pads and while the defibrillator is charging. Then once it is charged, stop CPR briefly and confirm that the rhythm is still shockable, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Biphasic defibrillators are recommended because their increased efficacy at lower energy levels. Use the initial dose of energy recommended by the manufacturer, which is usually 120 to 200 joules. If you do not know the recommended dose, use the maximal dose available. After initial defibrillation, resume CPR immediately without checking for a pulse. CPR should not be interrupted to assess the rhythm, and rhythm checks and additional shocks should not be performed any more frequently than every two minutes. If pulseless ventricular tachycardia persists after at least one attempt at defibrillation and two minutes of CPR, you can consider giving your first dose of epinephrine. However, since early defibrillation is considered the mainstay of treatment, and especially if you witness the cardiac arrest, it might be more important to defibrillate the patient with 120 joules biphasic or a higher dose for the second time after two minutes of CPR. If the patient does not achieve return on spontaneous circulation, with sinus rhythm after your second shock, continue CPR for two minutes and give one milligram epinephrine every three to five minutes. Antiarrhythmic drugs should be considered after a second unsuccessful defibrillation in anticipation of a third shock. So to summarize, so far, to treat a witness cardiac arrest of ventricular tachycardia, start CPR. Attach the defibrillator and shock at 120 joules biphasic. Continue CPR for two minutes and gain IV or IO access. Defibrillate 120 joules or higher. CPR for another two minutes, one milligram epinephrine every three to five minutes. Defibrillate 120 joules or higher. CPR for two minutes, amiodarone 300 milligrams IV. Defibrillate 120 joules or higher. CPR two minutes, epinephrine every three to five minutes. Defibrillate 120 joules or higher. Amiodarone 150 milligrams IV.
However, by this time, if your therapies have not converted this rhythm, your ventricular tachycardia has most likely deteriorated into ventricular fibrillation and maybe even a systole. Continue with your ACLS protocols, keeping in mind there will reach a point where despite your best efforts, return of spontaneous circulation is unlikely. But how do we treat those patients whose rhythm shows that of ventricular tachycardia who are hemodynamically unstable yet still responsive with a palpable pulse? In these patients, urgent synchronized cardioversion is recommended. You will want to do the humane thing and sedate the patient before cardioversion when feasible, however. Patients should be initially treated with synchronized cardioversion with a biphasic defibrillator at 100 joules, with subsequent shocks, if required, using escalating energy levels. Antiarrhythmic therapies such as IV amiodarone, percanamide, lidocaine, or oral agents such as sodalol or amiodarone are generally only indicated if sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia reoccurs, but I would call up your cardiologist and ask for his input before forgetting about antiarrhythmic therapy altogether. So if we have a stable patient with sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, no signs of hemodynamic compromise with a palpable pulse, either electrical or pharmacological cardioversion can be done. It is generally preferred to begin treating these patients with IV antiarrhythmic agents and reserve cardioversion for patients refractory to pharmacological therapy or those that have become unstable. Pharmacological cardioversion can be achieved with one of the following antiarrhythmic drugs. IV lidocaine can be given as an initial dose of 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, typically 75 to 100 milligrams at a rate of 25 to 50 milligrams per minute. Lower doses of 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams per kilogram can be repeated every 5 to 10 minutes as needed. If ventricular tachycardia terminates then, then there is typically no need to begin a continuous infusion. However, if ventricular tachycardia reoccurs, a continuous infusion of 1 to 4 milligrams per minute can be started. The maximum total dose per hour is 3 milligrams per kilogram or 300 milligrams per hour. It is rarely necessary to continue this infusion longer than 24 hours, and the incidence of neurotoxicity increases significantly after 24 hours. IV procainamide can also be administered in an infusion of 20 to 50 milligrams per minute. Be sure to monitor the blood pressure very closely every 5 to 10 minutes until the arrhythmia terminates, hypotension occurs, QRS is prolonged by more than 50%, or a total of 15 milligrams per kilogram has been given. So that would be a total of 1.2 grams in the typical 70 kilogram patient. Once VTAC terminates, it's usually not necessary to continue maintenance infusion, although procainamide can be resumed if VTAC recurs. Amiodarone IV can be administered with a 150 mg bolus over 10 minutes, followed by a continuous IV infusion of 1 mg per minute for 6 hours, and then 0.5 mg per minute generally for an additional 18 hours. Repeated boluses of 150 mg can be given over 10 minutes every 15 minutes to a maximum total dose of 2.2 grams in 24 hours. However, the blood pressure must be carefully monitored because amiodarone can cause hypotension when administered too quickly. Commonly, your cardiologist will want to give oral amiodarone in doses up to 400 milligrams every eight hours, overlapping the IV amiodarone for 24 to 48 hours. This high-dose oral amiodarone loading can be continued for seven to 10 days before decreasing to a maintenance dosing of 200 milligrams per day. Keep in mind the duration of IV and oral amiodarone loading will be dependent on the clinical response and tolerance of the drug. Sotolol is another option. The dose is 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram or a max dose of 100 milligrams at a rate of 10 to 20 milligrams per minute, closely monitoring for bradycardia, hypotension, or the development of other arrhythmias such as trossades de pointes. However, in your stable patients, despite pharmacological therapy, if they are still found to be in ventricular tachycardia, synchronized cardioversion will have to be done. In these patients, you will want to do the humane thing and sedate the patient before cardioversion. Patients should initially be treated with synchronized cardioversion with a biphasic defibrillator at 100 joules, with subsequent shocks, if required, using escalating energy levels. Now, we know how to treat sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, but how do we treat tersades de pointes, which is a type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Well, in the unstable, unconscious patient, they need urgent defibrillation. 
However, if these patients just had a short run of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that terminated on its own, you want to give 2 grams IV magnesium sulfate and correct any underlying electrolyte abnormalities such as low potassium or magnesium. Other therapies you can consider in this stable patient is a temporary transvenous overdrive pacing at rates of about 100 beats per minute, which may help to shorten the QT interval. Well, that's everything we're going to cover today on ventricular tachycardia. I hope this was able to bring you guys some clarity on the subject. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.